the recording and officially begin. Welcome back to school, or welcome to my 2 o'clock class, those of you who are here at 12.30. Welcome back. It's all good. I am your fearless leader for the semester. Uh, Lisa Hoffman is my name. You can call me Lisa. You can call me Dr. Hoffman if you must, but know that that is awkward and weird to me sometimes. And Dr. Lisa sounds like a radio talk show host, and so I, I don't usually use that one either. So you can just call me Lisa. It's fine. Um, this class, we are lucky enough to have two TAs. I'd like for them to say hello to you as well. We'll start with uh, Vladimir, since you're at the top of my screen. Hi everyone. Hi everyone. This is connected. This my mic. Is connected. My mic. Um, um, nice. Nice. It's nice to be here. Nice to be here. Um, um, this is my this is third, my year, third working year working as TA for this class. I'm here to, I'm help, here to help, and help, and I will be available will be to talk about, talk about content, content, homework, homework and, and different and things. Different so, if so you want to talk or you have questions, about, questions about something, uh, please don't uh, hesitate please don't to just go to the office hours or email. I'm here to help. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. And Nikki. Hi, everybody. My everybody. name is Nikki Tennyson. I use she, her uh, pronouns. I'm in the Higher Education and Student Affairs program as well as the well Educational well Measurement and Statistics, Statistics program. I have been a team for Lisa on a handful of classes, so I'm excited to be excited back, to for be back for generalized. Um, similar um, to Vladimir, I'm excited to help with concepts and homework and different things like that. I My base program is data, but I do help with R and any other software that will be covered in this class. Yes, SAS, STATA, and R, although I'm emphasizing STATA and R. So both both the TAs, I believe, are fluent in those packages and can help you. Uh, Nikki is an interesting case. Nikki, uh, how many PhDs are you doing at Iowa again? Two. Two. <laughs> yeah. So she thought this stuff was so cool that she became a master's student and then was like, oh, no, 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 it's cooler than that. I'm going to get a PhD in measurement and stat as well as ESA. So that is pretty cool. And one PhD is enough for the rest of you. That's fine, too. But hopefully I can lure you into our master's program, if not. It's a, in a lot of programs such as ESA, I know they already have a lot of quantitative methods requirements, and so there's, there's a, quite a bit of a... Uh, coordination that can be done, we'll say. But anywho. All right, so those are your TAs. You met me. Um, on the course website are the locations of all of our office office hours and such. Um, I am holding my office hours on Zoom, as is Nikki, and, and uh, Vladimir's are hybrid. So you can come and talk to us in those opportunities as well. Um, let's see here. So you've got the, the web page. That's where everything is. On the web page, there is a link to Lecture Zero, which I put together to keep myself from rambling too much. So that means I need to get the screen share going here. And hopefully my computer will continue to work. Okay, do you see an orange slide deck? Yes, this class is orange. I color code my classes so that I try not to get things confused. Earlier class is purple, this one is orange. All right, and you can still hear me and see me okay, right? We're good? Okay, if anything happens, if uh, my camera shuts itself off for no reason or my microphone shorts out, please let me know and I will try to fix it. That has happened before, but we're just going to roll with it. It's like uh, spring 2021 all over again, where we're trapped inside and it's cold and at least not there's not as many sick people this time. Who knows? Vamos again. All right. So, welcome back. What to expect? Let me just start with my mission statement here. All of you can do this. I know that this is an elective course. I know that you don't have to be here, but you've chosen to be here, or someone else chose for you to be here, which is, you know, functionally the same thing. And I just want to begin by saying, look, we can all do this. I know that quantitative methods is something that is can be stressful or intimidating to people, and my objective is to make it the opposite of that. I believe that we can all do this. I get a lot of, well, I'm, I'm not good at math, or I didn't take a lot of math. The hard part about this stuff is not the math. It's the working memory load. It is trying to match the ideas and the words and the notation and the software and get it all going together at the same time. That is a working memory problem. It's not a math problem. So that's where the difficulty is going to be. 
In order to help manage that difficulty, I try to focus on accessibility and mastery learning. That means we're not going to do things that are going to make you nervous. We're not taking timed exams. We're not going to be doing hand calculations or memorizing things. We're not doing proofs or theorems or lemmas or any of those scary words. If you'd like to do those things, there are places on campus that you can do them, but this is not going to be that. Instead, I want to be able to train you to use these analyses to make your research better. I want you to become stronger at quantitative methods so that you can answer more questions, do a better job, get papers out, and do all of the things that you're looking forward to doing in your career. So the way that I've organized the class materials, um, I have units that are compilations of a lecture and then one or more examples, and I keep those in separate documents. So you'll see slide decks that look like this for the lecture, in which I'm focusing on the what and the why, and usually the slides are packed with words and pictures and notation. And to that I say sorry, but I'm not sorry. I want you to sit and listen and think and absorb and not spend all of your time typing or writing furiously. To the point where in previous classes I've had people walk on treadmills during class, get their steps in, multitask. If you want to fold some laundry or eat some lunch or do anything else in the background while you're listening, that's fine with me too. And our classroom, I think technically since it has computer lab, um, they don't like to have food in there, but I'm not going to care. So if you ever need to, have to bring snacks, just try not to spill anything and we'll be good. The example documents that I have are going to be separate, and those are going to be compilations of annotated syntax and output and questions and visuals and things like that. I don't run things live in class because I want to have everything sort of how I want it so that we can go over the process, but all of the original files that create the examples will be available for you so you can actually work within the syntax files directly if you prefer to do things that way. Um, in terms of what the examples are going to cover, it's data analysis using the models we're going to talk about in this class, using Stata or R as the two packages that I am promoting and uh, that I'd like you to choose from. You don't have to learn both. Which one you choose is going to be up to you and your advisors and what's going to be most necessary, but those, one of those two would be ideal. I also have everything prepared in SAS because I used to teach that in this class as well, and so those materials will be available for download as well. So if you prefer to use SAS, that's also an option for you. It just won't be in the example handouts. Towards the end of this class, we'll be using a package called M+, which is going to be used for path analysis. And I will make sure that everyone has access to that package as well. All of the course materials are located on an external website, the one that I put into the chat a little bit ago. Um, the reason that I do it that way is so that you can access these things when you're not in the class. That way you always have a place to come back to and you can get all of the materials again. Um, I tend to fuss with my materials a lot. I make little changes, but if I make large changes after I post something, I'll put an update um, as to like when it was last updated. That way you'll know that there's a new version out there and I'll also announce such changes in class. Um, Icon is going to be used for very few things. That's where the course readings are. So um, under files, under Icon, there's a zip folder that has everything. The course webpage also has links to the library versions of the textbooks where you can log in so you don't need to go and buy anything. You should be able to just walk into this class and have everything that you need. Um, there, the course website also will have links to recordings. So I record everything that I do in terms of teaching and usually in workshops if I'm allowed as well. That way you can always come back to the material and review it as frequently as you want. I host the recordings on YouTube. I do that because it has a very nice transcription algorithm and it's searchable. So if you ever want to find out, you know, when did she talk about that in class? You can do a search for whatever word you're looking for and it will pull it up where it is in the video, which is a really nice feature. All right, so what are you going to be doing? Nothing stressful. Everything in this class is going to be take home, open note, and untimed. I want you to be able to take as much time as you need to feel good about the work that you're doing. I know that things happen, that you have other responsibilities besides this class, and so I do accept late work. You don't have to worry that you, you like if you miss a deadline, that's it. There's nothing that you can't come back from. However, to make sure that folks stay with the material and don't let it get you know pushed to the bottom of the stack, I do take off late points for late work. So homeworks, we'll talk about in just a second. There are two points out of 100 off if you're late on that. And for formative assessments or other smaller things, it's one point off. So just a small penalty. Like I said, nothing you can't come back from. Just to encourage you to keep, keep up with the work. 
Um, that being said, look through the syllabus if you know that you're going to have scheduling conflicts. So if you're going to be out of town for a conference or a family obligation or other things that are happening to you and you need to move a deadline to accommodate those other responsibilities, just ask. I'm happy to grant extensions if you're doing so planfully as opposed to reactively. If something else happens to you, you know, you get sick, or your kids are sick or whatever, just let me know and I'll try to work with you as, as much as possible. I'm not trying to be punitive, I'm just trying to make sure that it doesn't get pushed into the someday stack, right? Things without hard deadlines get pushed a lot of the time. In terms of the deadlines as they currently are, I promise nothing will ever be due sooner than it says right now, but it may get pushed to be later. I always want to make sure that there's at least a week between when we finish something and you're responsible for being able to do work on it. So if we get behind schedule, I might push the deadlines a little bit, but they will never be earlier than what they currently are. And anytime I move a deadline, I always update the printable syllabus, send out an email, and so forth. And the work that we're doing, uh, two kinds basically. There's what I call formative assessments, which are opportunities for structured review. These are going to be hosted in ICON, and each of these is worth two points, so it'll be six in total. They'll be due on Monday nights, so that Tuesday morning I can read over your answers and we'll go over them in class. And these should be things that you can answer off the top of your head. They will focus on concepts, definitions for things that I need you to learn so that we can add more content to it and stuff like that. So if you're looking at the questions and you realize that you don't know how to answer them, that's a good indicator as to where you would want to go back and review. If you're looking at this and you're realizing that you still have more questions or you don't understand something, write that down as part of your answer and we'll go over it. So it's a check-in point to make sure that I can see how you guys are doing, if there's any common points of, of confusion or anything like that and then you can test yourself as to what's happening. And you get two points for doing these. They're not graded based on accuracy, they're graded based on effort. If you put forth a good effort, that's fine. Um, six homework assignments in this class is what I have planned for the other 88 points. These are all going to give you practice in actually executing the models that we're going to talk about. Uh, most of these, five of them are going to be based on um, simulated data, where I know what the answer is, and all of them are going to be based on examples in class. So that is, if you find yourself opening the Google or the ChatGPT to get help with your homework, stop. Just stop. Because I'm not going to ask you to do anything that I haven't given you an example for. So ask me if you need help. Don't ask the Google. And I still feel pretty good about my place in the world in terms of, of my job from ChatGPT. It's not good enough yet to replace me. So don't, don't go down that rabbit hole. Just don't do that to yourself. It will make it worse, I promise. So the opportunities for practice involve a, a custom online homework system that I've been using for many years. If you've been in one of my classes before, then you know this, but if you haven't, you'll get a chance to practice it. Homework Zero is an extra credit assignment designed to give you exposure to the system to make sure everyone can log in and so forth. So examples, or excuse me, homeworks one through four and six are all going to be using canned data. Uh, the way that it works is that I use your ID number as a random seed by which to simulate data. So each of you has your very own data set with your very own answers. The system will ask you to do things like estimate a model that has this predictor and this outcome, for instance, and then it will ask you questions about the model. Several of the questions are going to be numeric, where there is only one right answer. You type in your numbers, you hit enter, and if it's right, it turns green, and if it's wrong, it turns red. And if it's red, you keep going until it gets right. And I don't know or care how many tries it takes until you get it right. That's all. Just getting there is, is the point. So all of that will ensure that you have the right models and the right information. And then the second part is paragraph completion or multiple choice questions sometimes where you're asked to interpret the results of your model. And these interpretations are tied directly to what you found in your results. So for instance, I might ask you to describe a slope as significantly positive or non-significantly positive or significantly negative or non-significantly negative. And there's a drop-down menu once you select the answer that goes with your slope in your data set. So this way I can ask some fairly complicated questions in, in models, but you know if you're on the right track right away. So you'll have all the numbers correct and then you can answer the questions about what they mean 
and after the due date has passed, then you get feedback on the second part. So because it's multiple choice, um, there's no point in asking you know, to get it correct all right away because you could just keep trying until you get the right answer. But afterwards, um, you will see your answers on the screen and the ones that are right will be shown in one color and the ones that are wrong will be shown in another color followed by what the right answer is. I had been using red, red and green, but it was pointed out to me that that is probably not the best thing for all uh, types of eyes. So I'm trying to see if I can come up with a color palette that would be more, um, that would work for everybody better. But we'll, but we'll stay tuned on that, but we're using color to isolate those things. So these things are designed to make sure that you get practice with sort of a controlled environment, but I also want you to be able to do your own analyses on data that you care about. And you'll have that opportunity for homework five, which is going to be due like probably mid to late April on the syllabus. So it's not a final project, it's just an assignment. And for that, I would like you to find data that you care about to analyze with some of the techniques we've covered in class. I'll give you a lot more um, information about what that's like, but just to put the pin in that, you will get the chance to do your own data analyses, write them up as a results section, and get my feedback, and you will get a chance to complete a revision to that assignment so that you can get up to as many points as possible. And that, the revision will be due at the end of finals week. So, lots of things to be to working on here. All right, so any questions about course responsibilities and such up to this point? Cheers. You can use the chat or you can try to talk to me and we'll see if my speakers work. No questions. Can you hear me? Let's go with a rhetorical question. Excellent. Shameless in getting course present. Of course, uh, what's the word I want? Participation. That's the word I want. If I can't find the word on the first three tries, I think it's time to put the Mountain Dew away. All right, I'll we'll switch to water. I've, I've ascended over the top of the caffeine curve and I'm coming back down the other side. That's what happens, right? Too much is not good. All right, and I don't hear anything upstairs, so I think my kid's still alive, but you know, he may come in and say hi at some point. If so, we'll have to start talking about Pokemon or some shit like that instead. All right, so my job is to help you navigate the complexity of the models that we're gonna talk about in this class, and I take that responsibility very seriously. So yes, there are a ton of readings on your list, and there are textbooks, and there's lots of things that you could go through. Those are designed to be done after we talk about something. I want to have the first shot. The material that we're going to cover is not the kind of material where you can read the chapter the night before and teach, you teach your classmates. I'm not going to run my class like that. that. This type of content does not lend itself well to that format, so it's on me. Um, we do sort of lectures, so to speak, but I prefer that they be more of a conversation. So talking back and forth, asking questions. Love Pokemon there too, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, he has Pokemon dictionaries and he has them memorized. Like he'll tell me, you know, who the evolved form of, you know, Sendor is or whatever. I'm just making stuff up at this point. I only know a few of them. I know Snorlax and uh, that's about it. <laughs> Because he was Snorlax for Halloween, that's how I know. But anywho, ba back to the story here. This stuff is hard, so let me help you. Um, I have a whole lot of readings as another way to communicate with you beyond the way that I do it. Because I have my own style, I have my own way of explaining shit, and that may not be adequate. So the readings span a lot of content in terms of the more technical side. So there's an Agresti book that has several more technical things for those of you who are, are majoring in this and you want to know more about like what the likelihood function looks like and all that kind of stuff. I have a whole bunch of tutorial articles that were written for like how do I use this technique in this field kind of thing that are, are coming at it from a different perspective. And then there's articles that are just extensions of models that I might have time to like wave my hand at briefly but not talk about in great detail that I want you to have more resources for. So there's a ton of readings. Those are not meant to be your teacher though, that's my job. 
So you can email me questions. Um, you can also email the TAs questions, but I would prefer that you start with me unless you're working with them in office hours and you have a follow-up with something you talked about there, then I think it's fine to go ahead and contact them and I don't need to get involved. But otherwise, I'm trying to, to limit the amount of hours that they're supposed to be spending on all of this. So your job is to ask questions, and I mean that wholeheartedly. Um, questions can range from, can you say that again, to what does this mean, all the way up to, here's what I think you said. Can I say it back to you and see if I'm right? Any of those are good. And as I told the first class here, there is no such thing as a stupid question. There is not. Because if you ask a stupid question, one of three things is going to happen. I've added a third. The first is that there's going to be a whole bunch of people who are relieved that you asked the question because they didn't know either and they want to hear the answer. Good for them to hear it. Second is there's going to be several people who think they know the answer. They're going to listen to it and then they're going to feel good about themselves because they did know the answer. And so you just made their day. You gave them a boost of confidence. Also a good thing. Third is that there's those of you who are thinking about this from the lens of becoming an instructor. Think about how you would have answered the question, or better yet, how would you have explained it in the first place so the question was unnecessary. Those are higher level cognitive activities that can be happening even for dumb questions, which is why there is no such thing as a dumb question. Yes, because uh, the, the teaching thing, even if you're not majoring in measurement and stat, I can't tell you how many job ads I have seen in the past couple years that say, we want somebody who fits into our, our program in you know, psychology is usually where I see them, who can also teach our methods courses. Right? So even if that's not your specialty, you may find yourself in the position of becoming an instructor for methodology and starting to think about how you would approach that task and what you can learn from your experience passively as a participant is a good thing. So. So ask questions. In class is best, that way everyone gets to hear the answers, but any time is better than none. If you're shy, use the direct messaging feature and talk to me directly. I'll read the question out and then you don't have to, to be brave and open, open your mouth. Um, if you get stuck on homework, if you're fighting with R and you get the same error message for 15 minutes in a row, take a screenshot of it, email it to me, and close the laptop. Walk away. That's the rule. I don't want you to get frustrated trying to troubleshoot things when it could be something like, you know, a missing comma or a missing parenthesis or something silly like that that has nothing to do with your understanding of the material. Let me help you troubleshoot these things. And if I need help troubleshooting, I'll go to Vladimir and Nikki who are better at R than me. Because I'm still learning it. So don't be afraid to ask for help. That's what we're here for. Uh, the readings are to help you, but you sh should make sure that you are focusing on the lecture materials, reviewing those, and doing your homework as the primary thing. And practicing is always a good thing too. If you have data that you want to talk to me about, um, like during office hours, that would be fine. Or after class, you can make an appointment and talk to me about the research data that you're working with, and we can talk about that. In terms of attendance, I just want to say thanks for being here. I know you don't have to be here. You have a choice of instructors and you've chosen to fly Lisa today. Thank you very much. But if you can't always be here, that's okay too. I don't take attendance and I don't require it because I think it's unrealistic at this point. If you ghost me though, I will notice. If you don't come and you don't turn in your work, I reserve the right to nag you. Fair? No ghosting? We can agree on that as a policy? However you want to show up, though, is fine. You can choose on a given day whether you want to come on Zoom or whether you want to come in person. I don't need to know about it. I don't need to know your reasons. Um, there are some folks who rarely come and they make use of the recordings. That is possible. Those folks have done well, but I don't recommend it because it's easy to let things sort of pile up when it's like, oh, I'll, I'll catch up on that later. I'll catch up on that later. And showing up when the class is actually happening, I think, is a way to hold yourself accountable, not to mention the fact that it's hard to get your questions answered on a recording, right? Like, if you don't understand something in the first five minutes, then the rest of the video is kind of a waste. So it's, that's why attendance, I still believe, is a good thing. However, if you might be sick, please don't come. Please stay on Zoom if you're sick, or you might be sick. Because if I get sick, then I get my kids sick, and he gets his class sick, and he gets his teacher sick, and it's like a whole thing. So please be considerate and stay home if you are not feeling well. 
I record everything. You're not going to miss out. As I mentioned, here is a link to the YouTube playlist. Every day after class, oh, I will process the video and post it on the web page where the class was held. That way you can see what we covered that day. These videos, by the way, are not edited. I just literally hit stop and five mouse clicks later I put it up on YouTube. So you will hear every stutter, every sneeze, every everything that I do. I'm not trying to look good. These are faithful reproductions of what happened in class. What is captured on these videos, by the way, is the audio, no screens of you or me, and the, sh the screen that is shared. So if you don't want your voice to be on the recording, then don't sit next to the microphone or type in the chat window instead. But I, uh, it hasn't been an issue up to this point. No, no one's pictures are going to be online, including me. So weather happens. Case in point today. Uh, last spring, I had to move classes to Zoom or cancel them outright because of tornadoes, not just snow and frozen cold. So I will not hesitate to pull the plug on class if it's not safe for us to be in it, for whatever reason. Um, your health and safety is far more important than anything I have to say on a given day. And I'm a parent, I know some of you are parents, and if, if schools are out, then you have to figure out what to do with your kid, and that's a whole thing. So if weather is bad, check your email. If the public schools are closed in Iowa City, odds are good we're moving to Zoom, because I don't want you out in the dangerous cold or snow either. So I will let you know by 9 a.m. I will post announcements and post emails and let everybody know. Um, if you're already on campus and you want to go to the classroom where we would be, that's fine. The room will still be open. So you can use that space to Zoom from if you don't have your own office or a quiet space to go to. Okay. Questions about any of this? Sit my water, not my Mountain Dew. We're good? All right, don't hesitate to be shy. No, don't, don't hesitate to be shy. Don't hesitate, don't be shy. How's that? Yeah, I think I'm out of practice. <laughs> it's like I haven't taught for a month and I've forgotten how to talk. Anyone else feel that way? Like you sit back at your desk and you're like, what's my password? Like, what do I do? I don't, I, I don't know what this is. Yeah, it was a long break and then like the past two weeks when we weren't supposed to be in break, we're still in break because the weather and stuff. So yeah, we're, we're all a little like discombobulated, I think. So work with me. We're going to make this work no matter what. All right, so software. We have to use software to estimate these models. The models that we're talking about do not, cannot be done by hand. So you don't have to worry about making hand calculations because it's not possible. There might be one or two, like, few things that I'll ask you to do a hand calculation for, but by and large, the software is going to do it for you. And those would be, like, subtracting two numbers or something like that. Yeah, not just kids hanging out of the house. Grateful that the few other people can get out of the house, too. Yes, I, I'm looking forward to being home alone with no TV or Pokemon or Minecraft blaring in the background. It's going to be glorious. Someday. Anywho, working on software, though, one of the things I could have forgotten along with how to teach. Um, Stata and R is what I'm emphasizing. And so I get questions about why is it that I'm doing these things and not others? Well, SPSS. I have nothing against SPSS. And if you know it and use it, great. Unfortunately, it doesn't do everything that I need it to do. And so for that reason, I'm not using it. It's not used in any other EMS advanced classes. It's not something that we teach. And so if you're only using SPSS, the time has come to learn something else. Um, if you like the drop-down menus to generate syntax as a starting point, Stata has a really nice feature for that. It works a lot like SPSS in that regard, but it has a lot more stuff in it. It's been more continuously updated. Um, my story is that I started with SPSS, I picked up SAS as a postdoc and got very good at that, and then the rest of the world quit using SAS. So I have accepted that reality. I have waved goodbye to it in, in most of my classes, but because that's what I feel most comfortable in, that's where I start. When I make your examples, I get them running in SAS, and then I check the output against the other programs to see if I know what I'm doing. So for that reason, I still have SAS in all of the course materials, and you can use it to do your homework, because that's actually where the homework system starts. It's a giant SAS program. 
So I've learned Stata and I've grown to like it more because it's made for data analysis. Stata has a lot of functions and very simple pieces of code that spit out a whole lot of information with relatively little work and for that reason I like it. It's also continually being updated with modern stuff. So Stata is, is a, it's, it's a living package. Um, the entire world has decided that R is the way to go except me. So I'm begrudgingly learning it still. I don't like it. I never will. That's my caveat. Um, I stick with base R. So if you're used to the tidyverse to do data manipulations and things like that and you know what you're doing, go for it. But you're not going to see that stuff in my examples because I don't use it. My examples, I try to make them transparent, not efficient. So if you look at my code and you're like, yeah, I know how to do that more quickly, go for it then you have the right answer. But I will show you the ways that I've learned how to do these things, which I think are helpful for people who are just getting started like myself. So with those caveats, if you know of ways to do things that are better or more efficient or different, and I will mention various points in the class where I've hit walls on things, please let me know. I will not be offended if I am corrected on my fledgling knowledge of R or Stata. Um, I know enough to teach in those, but I don't know everything there is to know. So please help me out if you can. So all of these programs are available on the virtual desktop. Stata is also available on the research remote desktop thing. Um, that recently changed over into a new system, but I believe it's still working the same way. In thinking about which programs to spend your time learning, if this is new for you, the main reason people use R is because it's free. So you can install it on your own device. You don't have to worry about logging into anything, and you can do whatever you need to do on that. Stata is available for free through campus, but you can also buy a student license for six months that's about 50 bucks. If you're one of those people who just wants to throw money at a problem and not deal with the virtual desktop, then that would be an option for you. Um, Stata is much more common in certain fields. So I know in sociology here and EPLS here and other disciplines as listed, Stata is much more common. So if you're somebody whose research advisor is a Stata user and you're like, well, I should probably use Stata, that's, that would be a good reason to do so. Um, one of the things that I like about it is the documentation is very extensive and very easy to understand. Um, I have a, I've had good luck finding things and figuring out how to do things in Stata. R is what is used by everyone else in the EMS program. I'm the only one who teaches in anything but R. So if you're planning on taking further coursework in our program, you'll have to learn R eventually. The thing that I don't like about R is that the documentation is usually not very good, not very thorough, and the quality control is absent. So there will be packages that do things that are wrong or unstable because the authors may not have known the best way to do things in terms of numeric precision. And yes, I have seen that kind of stuff happen before. Um, so I'm not as big of a fan for those reasons, but I will tell you when to expect differences across packages. There are a few types of models in which there are going to be differences and there are for specific reasons that we can't control. But for the most part, I'm going to try to do everything in all the packages so that you can choose which one you want to focus on. I will point out though that learning multiple packages just for learning them is still a useful thing. All of you on your CV should start building what I would call a technical skills section where you list all of the different software packages that you know how to use for research. Um, anything that is like for web, like if you know any type of, of like specialized software like that, the more things you can list, the better off you'll be. So using both might not be a bad idea from that perspective as well. So in terms of syntax, if you're feeling nervous because you're not familiar with Stata or R, don't worry. As I promised, I will give you an example of anything I'm asking you to do. And what you will need to do is exactly what I do still. Find the example original source file that goes with this, the original syntax. Figure out how to modify it to do what I'm asking you to do. So things like changing the name of the data set, changing the name of the outcome variable, changing the name of the predictors. Those are relatively trivial changes once you've got the structure in place. So find and replace is going to be your friend when it comes to making syntax work quickly. I'm not expecting you to look for anything that is not explicitly already in the examples. I want the focus to be on the models, not fighting with R as much as possible. 
So what you should know then, in terms of what I'm expecting you to have exposure to, the formal prerequisite for this course is 6243, which is our version of an introduction of general linear models within um, our department. But I've looked at the roster and many of you are not from here. Can I get a hand from psychology folks? Say hi. T, raise your hand. Yeah, there, there you are. There's Sarah's from psychology. Sociology. Anyone? Business? Accounting. Medicine. Communications. Political science? Who am I leaving out? Anyone else from outside the College of Ed? There's three There's social three workers. Social work. social work, that's what it was. I couldn't come up with it. I knew there was some new folks. Yes, they welcome social workers. So my point in listing all these is that I know, um, yes, psych undergrad and now an EMS. Welcome to the party. I'm a psychologist. Don't tell anyone, though. I work in the College of Ed. But that's where my PhD is from. The uh, R version of general linear models is probably like what you would have taken elsewhere on campus, right? There's a lot of departments that have their own version of like their first course in staff. And so I think it's more useful just to talk about what the content is rather than like which course you should have taken. Um, some of this content you probably covered in your undergraduate work because this is this is undergraduate content and nowadays it's high school. They're teaching statistics in high school. Um, there, Jonathan got asked, um, we got asked to go talk to a high school uh, last year where they had an AP stats course that was basically covering regression models and stuff. So yeah, it's kind of crazy. But this is the stuff. So descriptive statistics, bivariate association, things like correlations, um, the concept of a p-value, inference, like that kind of stuff. General linear models, so when I say that I mean regression, analysis of variance, analysis of covariance, that kind of stuff. Um, and how to use software to do all of this. That's what I'm hoping you have familiarity with. However, we are going to review general linear models as the first unit in this course because even if you've had that content before, I need to make sure that you're familiar with the way that I describe things because that's the basis in which I'm going to add content for this class. So I found it useful to start with a review to make sure we're all on the same page. In particular, interaction terms. So there are going to be a lot of examples that involve interaction terms this semester, and that's something I found folks don't always get good coverage of. So that's one of the emphasis that I will make in that unit, is to make sure we all know what to do with an interaction term. If you are looking through this list and thinking, maybe I need to do some more review, I would recommend looking at my version of Intermediate, which is where this stuff was orig originally introduced. I keep all my courses online so that you can review anything that you want anytime. But this course is focusing then on generalized linear models, which is not a synonym. General and generalized are not the same thing. So that's what this is. So we have sort of three sort of general sections. After reviewing regression and ANOVA using continuous outcomes, we're going to do the same thing with other kinds of outcomes. So unit two is categorical. How to predict something that's binary, ordinal, or nominal. Three is going to be count outcomes. So how many cigarettes did you smoke today? Um, how many days did you stay in the hospital? Things like that. Um, I refer to these often as if and how much because a lot of count outcomes have a big pile of zeros. If you have part of your sample for whom the measure is not applicable. So for instance, if I asked how many cigarettes did you smoke today, I would expect that there would be a large distribution of zeros because a lot of people are non-smokers and then some kind of continuous distribution after that. Those are technically known as zero inflated. I refer to them more colloquially as, as if and how much. Then other kinds of not normal. So binomial outcomes, for instance, things like accuracy rates, right? That's not continuous. It stops at zero and it goes up to 100. So your model has to understand 
that your outcome has boundaries and you can't predict past those boundaries or it doesn't make any sense. Uh, outcomes that are otherwise skewed, things like response time, things like uh, incomes, housing prices. And within that unit, one of the things you can do to address skewed data, and particularly when you're concerned with outliers having extreme influence, is something called quantile regression, which is not technically a generalized model, but I put it in here because it's within that same framework. So those are the things we'll talk about first. Then we switch gears a little bit, because the other purpose of this class is to help get you ready for models that are truly multivariate, where we're predicting multiple things at the same time. So multivariate models, so things like repeated measures, dyadic or family data, different scores, we'll learn how to do those within the concepts of path analysis as well as within traditional uh, regression type software. That will wind us up into the last unit examining mediation, which is very, very common in research. I think of it as regression with a better marketing campaign, but I want you to know how to do it and to use the language. So we'll do mediation involving normal outcomes as well as not normal outcomes, and that will wrap us up for the whole semester. So I, as I'll talk about, probably not today, next time, I view this course as a stepping stone for all of the other advanced courses because there's a whole lot of new things in the advanced courses at the same time. This is designed to introduce some of them in a more limited context so that you're better prepared for the newer stuff that is specific to those higher order courses. So like in multi-level models or structural equation models, for instance, there's random effects and latent variables. That's hard enough. If you have all of these concepts underneath it, then it will go much easier for you. So for those of you who just finished general linear models, you are in the right place. I designed this class specifically for that purpose, to be the bridge to the advanced coursework that you may find yourself wanting or needing to take. All right, how are we doing? Thumbs up? Okay, so I have to introduce to my thumb scale. You see, you can have thumbs up, which means good, continuously over to thumbs sideways, which means meh, and then down, which is self-explanatory. If you're not on camera, then you have limited choices of thumbs. I would accept a poop emoji for thumbs down, but I think they actually introduced a thumbs down emoji. I don't think they have thumbs sideways though yet. Okay, so show me your thumbs. How are we feeling about this so far? Not scared yet. Okay, I would also accept meh, because, you know, it's Tuesday and we're on Zoom. <laughs> so I think meh is called for after I've been, you know, stuck at home for however long. All right, so big picture then. Legos. My son has a million Legos. He doesn't play with them very much anymore, which is sort of sad, but Legos are a great tool. And the reason Legos are so great is that individually they're very simple, but they can combine to make amazing creations such as this exhibit at the Mall of America. Legos are how I approach the instruction of quantitative methods. What are the building blocks and what can you make when you start stacking them together in novel ways? So I want to describe to you four Legos that I think most of quantitative methods are based on, what they are, and how this course relates to that in concept. So the, the origins of this course started when I was, so this is my third faculty job. I started at the University of Nebraska in psychology. I also worked at the University of Kansas at a center in arts and sciences, which was sort of psych adjacent. And now I work in the College of Education here at Iowa. And each of these jobs has had the same challenge in terms of instruction of quantitative methods, is that where you finish in like your standard regression ANOVA type courses and where you're headed in terms of the advanced coursework, there's a huge canyon between those two things. There's way too many new ideas, words, uh, techniques, practices, I don't even know, like I'm out of adjectives, but there's way too much new stuff at the same time. So trying to figure out a way to bring that new stuff on board in a more structured, scaffolded way is something we've been working on for a very long time. So that's one of the secret objectives of this course is to accomplish that goal, not just teach you the content that the course focuses on. So I want you to become conversant in traditional methods that are still used, but recognize the building blocks of them so that you can change them out when you need to. 
So this is, I think of it as a bridge. This course is a bridge to the advanced courses, in my opinion, the, those that I teach and those that other people teach. And this is a philosophy. This Lego idea is my philosophy for how those courses, what the building blocks are and how they are logically structured. So the three Legos that we're going to do in this course, linear models, estimation, and link functions. Those are the three things. Knowing those will make it a lot easier to pick up the fourth Lego, which has an A and a B part, random effects and latent variables. Have you heard these terms before? Latent variables probably. Random effects are the opposite of fixed effects. It's the idea that each sampling unit needs their own version of a slope or an intercept. The reason these are both number four is because these are the same thing. They are used for different purposes. You would call it random effects if you're estimating regression models predicting multiple dimensions of sampling at the same time. So in educational data, for instance, students are nested within classrooms, which are nested within schools. So you can have a school-level set of relations, a teacher-classroom set of relations, and a kid set of relations happening simultaneously through random effects. The same thing, from a completely different perspective, is what we would call latent variables. And this is the world of measurement models, which is the class uh, I'm teaching at 1230 this year. So things like factor analysis, item response theory, item factor analysis, structural equation models, all of those things run on latent variables. And if you haven't had these blocks, trying to learn number four is really, really challenging. So I'm trying to sort of spread it out a little bit more to make it so that when you get to these things, you can focus on just this as the new part. So what do I mean by linear models? When you're first learning statistics, like this is what you think of as the model. What's my outcome variable or variables? What are my predictors? What kinds of questions are going to motivate the way that I specify the effects of those predictors? So is there a specific effect of a, of a certain variable? Is that effect the same for everybody or does it depend on other stuff? And is that effect still there after I control for X, Y, Z, other thing that the reviewers want me to look at? Those types of questions are fundamental linear models questions. But beyond that, we have to think about how the predictors have their effects. Does this predictor just need one slope? Is that slope linear? Is it nonlinear? Um, if it's a grouping variable, how many different groups need differentiated, and how do I want to do that so that I can directly answer my questions as best as possible? That's what I mean by linear models. So this worldview starts at the same place, but sometimes it looks a little bit different, particularly with the world of ANOVA. So when I learned ANOVA, I learned it as like a series of boxes, right? There were like tables of like marginal means and cell means, and this mean is different than that mean, and there's this F thing that shows up, and if the F thing is significant, then I look at these boxes. ANOVA is a linear model. What makes ANOVA ANOVA is that the predictors are categorical and not continuous. So if you approach it from the same regression way of looking at things, it becomes a lot easier and it becomes generalizable to other kinds of models like the ones we're going to do in this class. So anything that is predicting a continuous outcome, regardless of whether the predictor itself is quantitative or categorical, is considered a general linear model. Then we get into the nuances, and this is where it's unnecessarily confusing in a lot of, of older material. So if you have a continuous outcome that's being predicted by one quantitative predictor, so numbers mean numbers, you might call that simple linear regression. I hate the term simple, by the way. Whenever they put that in there, it's just being mean, I feel like. Can I get an amen on that? Like when you read an article and they're like, clearly, or as evident, obviously, right? Don't, don't piss off your reader. Don't, don't say something's obvious. Don't say something's simple. Because guess what? Nothing is simple when you're first learning it. So no, it's just linear regression. And if you put in multiple numeric predictors, quantitative, numeric, continuous, pick your word to describe them, then it's multiple linear regression. Sometimes you will put linear in there, and then they assume it sounds like everything has to have a line. It doesn't. That's a misnomer. We'll talk about that in the first unit. But what if I have grouping variables as my predictors? 
oh, well, if I have one grouping variable that only has two groups, and I want to know if it relates to a continuous outcome, whether that outcome has mean differences, oh no, that's a t-test. Wait, isn't there a t-test statistic for every single parameter in a regression model? Yes, but this one's called t-test. Okay, sure, let's go with that. What if I have more than two groups? What if I have a variable that has three groups? Oh, well now I need a whole new word. That's one way, ANOVA, or an analysis of variance. What if I have multiple grouping variables and I put all possible interactions in the model? Then that is two-way, or three-way, or four-way, ANOVA. And what if I need to control for some numeric variable in doing that, but not put the interactions in? Okay, well now that's ANCOVA. Can you put the interactions in? Of course you can. But it doesn't have a name. It's just regression at that point. So all of these distinctions about kinds of models are not really distinctions. They're kinds of predictors. It's all a general linear model, because what's going on under the hood boils down to that guy right there, E. E is what makes this a general linear model. So if I write out a model that looks like this, and we're going to review this in the first unit, so don't worry, I am going to be very careful with my subscripts when writing out models because subscripts are everything. So anything that has an I subscript is a variable. Anything that does not have an I subscript is a constant. I use color in my slides, usually. I put fixed effects, which is what these intercepts and slope are in red, and error-related terms in blue. So the predicted outcome for any person is a function of an intercept, which is the expected outcome when all my predictors are zero, plus the effect of each of these variables up to however many I have. The hat over this means what is predicted, not what is actual. So E is what's left. E is the difference between what Y is supposed to be and what it actually is. And the reason that all of these names on the previous slide are actually the same thing is because they all just have this E at the end. Maybe R. E or R? Can we take a vote? E? R? Don't care? <laughs> yeah, don't care. There's always a letter at the end. Sometimes it's epsilon, sometimes it's E. I tend to write, I choose notation that I can draw reliably on a board. That's why it's E, because I don't trust myself with a lot of the other Greek letters. But you are told when you start learning regression for the first time that things have to be true about E, right? What's supposed to be true about E in order for you to believe your results? Remember these things? These are assumptions. You're told they have to be true or else. You're told first, E is supposed to be normally distributed. Right? What's left over is supposed to be normally distributed. What is being predicted is Y hat. So whatever the predictors say Y is goes here as the predicted mean. And then there's some variance left over. And note there's only one. So the variance across people of these E residuals is one number that gets estimated by the model. The idea that it's one number is known as constant variance or homoscedasticity. Yeah, say that three times fast. Constant variance is what I prefer. Homosexuality? I'm sorry, Zoom, that is incorrect. The transcript messed it up. I'm going to try again. Homoscedasticity. Homo's good dust to city. Yep, that's closer. <laughs> now you know why I don't normally keep the transcript open. It's very distracting. But I was afraid that I couldn't hear you. So I, I'm letting the transcript try. Yeah, constant variance. Zoom, can we just say that? Okay, we got that one. We'll stick with that, constant variance. So the idea of normal is not nearly as important as constant variance. The idea that the model works equally well for everyone. That is what constant variance really implies.
The other big one that we need to worry about is independence. These are not supposed to be related to each other, but there's lots of examples in life when that is not going to be the case. These are going to be related if people come from the same family, the same classroom, if you have repeated measures from the same person, etc., etc. So these are assumptions, but what if they're not true? You take your ball and go home? Tell NIH that I can't finish analyzing the data that you paid $3 million for me to get because my assumptions are violated. I'm sorry. No. We fix the model. So that's the rest of the story of linear models. R linear models is about the predictor, but in order to believe the effects of the predictors that are as accurate as possible, we need to make sure that the rest of the model, this E part, is as accurate as possible. So generalized models are going to focus on changing the Y and the E part, and the rest of it's going to stay the same. The independence part, we're stuck with until about two-thirds of the course, and then we get to the multivariate models where we let the E's be related if they come from the same sampling unit. And the idea is that E's be related is all of multilevel modeling. I teach three different courses on that. E's be related. That's a direct quote. So this idea of constant variance is shown here in this picture that I stole. The idea that around the regression line that connects an X predictor to a Y outcome, there's, the line's not going to be perfect. It's going to stab the points as best it can, but it's not going to be perfect. So there's going to be some kind of spread around the lines. Constant variance means the spread is equal no matter where you are on the line. The model works equally well for people who are low on X as people who are high on X. That can only happen if Y is truly continuous and it keeps going forever and ever and there's no pileup on either end. Otherwise, you end up with something that looks like this very commonly. And I stole this picture too because I like the labels. Good, not good. This is homoscedasticity. This is heteroscedasticity. This type of fan shape on the bottom right here, that is very common in count data. Because what is the lowest count that you can have? Count of events. Number of some times something has happened. Zero, right? So there's no negative counts that can happen. So the model does a better job the closer you get to zero because it has less room to be wrong. However, what's the highest a count can be? Anything at once. So you got way more room to be wrong the higher you go. Saying this more technically, the residual variability, this spread of the dots around the lines, increases as the predicted outcome increases. The variance is tied to the mean. Turns out there are distributions that allow that to happen. So we're going to change what we say E has to look like, essentially. It's not going to be called E anymore, but it's the same idea. We're going to change the assumptions we make about the variable from being conditionally normal, conditional meaning after the predictors, to something that fits better for what it is. We got to leave general linear models to do it. So this is the point, by the way, once we leave general linear models, this is the point where hand calculations are no longer possible. In order to do that, we have to add in a new way of estimating the models. So what kind of linear model you need in terms of the Y part and the E part is dictated by what kind of outcome it is. And we're going to use something that is called a link function in this course to translate outcomes that have boundaries into something that is truly continuous that we can predict with our standard linear model. Then, how the E should get to be related is a separate concern addressed by adding random effects or latent variables. We're just going to see a tiny bit of that in this class at the end. That's what the other classes that are more advanced are for. But the way that we move into an E that is not normal is by changing the way that we estimate models. So regression models are typically estimated using something called ordinary least squares. You heard that term before in those classes? 
like minimize the sum of squared errors and then you have your sum of squares between and your sum of squares within and blah 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 all that that's least squares least squares doesn't work for this stuff so we're going to switch to something called maximum likelihood which is another way of figuring out what the best answers are instead of minimizing the sum of squared errors we're going to pick the answers that make the data the tallest that's the concept and when you get you get models that are too complicated and ML breaks, that's where Bayesian estimation can kick in, which is even higher, which is the combination of maximum likelihood with distributions that convey our beliefs about how what the parameter should actually be. Priors is what they're called. So we're not heading into Bayesland in this class, but I'm just putting it out there as sort of the next step in the chain. So ordinary least squares are just fine for standard regression problems where E is independent with constant variance and it is supposed to be normal. The constant variance part ties that together. But what if your outcome isn't normal? What if you have more than one outcome? What if you have people nested in groups? What if not everybody gave you all the information, you've been complete data? These are situations that happen all the time. And for that, we need to switch to something called maximum likelihood. If you understand the concept of a tape measure, you can do this. It's height. That's what maximum likelihood is. So here's a picture that I stole from Wikipedia. This is the normal distribution. This is the formula that gives the value on the y-axis, where if you plug in what you expect your y to be from your model, what your actual y was, and what the residual variance of the model is, out pops a number that tells you how likely or how tall your value is. And these are different parameters that would yield different heights. So the object of the game is to find the results that make your data set collectively as tall as possible. In this context, the formula for height that you're using is the normal distribution. That's how we're computing height. So we can do this in Excel. I have a Excel file posted for Thursday, and I have a SAS program that I did that goes with it that generates data to show this. But this is how we can approach it. So in Excel, there is a function called normdist. And if I have an outcome of 1, and because I have a variable here that I can com easily compute the mean of and the variance of, I know what the right answers are. There are closed formulas for those. People have figured out how to shortcut this process in certain cases. This number right here is the height given the model parameters for this observation. So given this mean, given this variance, everybody has the same predicted outcome. And then to make it so that we don't have to multiply tiny numbers together, we take the natural log and then we can add them instead. So this is the height in natural log scale of this person's 1 if the mean was 5. 1's not very likely. It's kind of far away from the mean relative to some of these other numbers. So you see that these values get smaller and smaller, excuse me, get bigger and bigger, likely, as we get closer to the mean and on the other side, and that's graphed over here. Now what if I plugged in the wrong value? What if I said, what was the height if this was my variance instead? Well, some of the people are going to get taller. The people in the middle that are close to the mean are going to get taller, but everyone else is lower. So the way that we know what the right answers are in maximum likelihood is it's the answers that make everybody's data collectively the tallest. And maximum likelihood estimation is the process of the computer iteratively trying out new answers. Okay, what if it was 6.5? What if it was 6.6? .6? What if it was 6.4? And then checking the height. And when you get to the highest number that it can get to, and it tries out new guesses for the parameters and it doesn't change very much, it says, boom, converged and spits out the numbers at you, and that's your output. That's maximum likelihood. What changes as a function of your outcome is what the formula is for height. If your outcome isn't normal, don't use the formula for normal. Pick a new one. 
So we can pick different distributions besides normal that give us different formulas for height and do the same damn thing. What are the model parameter values that make everybody's data the tallest as a function of what kind of outcome data do we have? So we will have linear models, meaning the same questions about predictors that we always have to worry about, maximum likelihood to get height for different kinds of outcomes given a different formula for height, and then we're going to have link functions which make it so that our outcome stays within the boundaries of what it needs to be. So what are some other choices then? Here are the ones that we'll talk about. For instance, categorical, binary, nominal, ordinal. You've seen these words before. Each of these can be outcome variables in a linear model, but they're not going to obey the rules of regression. The residuals are never going to be normal. And nominal, these aren't even numbers, right? These are kinds, so there's no way we could even pretend like it's a number. There are also quantitative variables that numbers are numbers, but they have boundaries. So binomial is one case. Number of occurrences out of possible. Things like accuracy rates, number correct. What's the worst you can do on a test? Goose eggs, right? Nothing. What's the best you can do on a test? Yeah, I'll, I'll go with one. And go with accuracy rates. Like I got all of them right. I got 100%. That's the best I can do. Should my regression model predict that someone's going to get 110% right? Probably not, right? That's not going to be useful. It can't predict that somebody gets negative 5% as well. So there's a lot of instances in which we have a number that is it's a numeric, but for whatever reason there's a boundary, like a floor effect or a ceiling effect, especially for accuracy, will throw these things off. There's, there's models and distributions to deal with that. Counts. Now we have a lower boundary of zero, but no upper boundary. So we have to solve a one-sided boundary instead. Censored is when there's a pileup due to measurement limitations. So like if you're following up somebody, how long does it take till something happens, but it never happens to them? Then you don't know how long it would have taken. There are models for those as well. All right, so this is the big, big picture of how generalized models work. I want to highlight for right now, the B part is the same. The process of deciding what predictors go in, how to think about their slopes, whether they should have linear slopes or nonlinear slopes, whether they should have interaction terms, all that part's exactly the same. What's new are these two. Different distributions based on what kind of outcome you're actually predicting, and link functions that ensure the predictions stay within the boundaries. That's the part that's new. So this semester's course is going to be swapping out link functions and conditional distributions that match the types of outcomes that we have. Categorical, binomial, count, censored, and so forth. What do you think? Is this stuff cool or what? I think it's pretty cool. Like, I don't know if I use the word cool, but... Maybe that's just my mouth. All right, 311. I think that is a good place to stop for today. Hopefully, Thursday, I will get to see you in person and we can do the thing where we go around the room and say where, who you are and stuff like that. Or on Zoom, your choice, but we'll see. Uh, I will let you know if the, the plan changes and we need to stay on Zoom. It just depends on the weather and everything else. And whether I get sick in the next two days, that could happen too. All right, questions. Are we still feeling reasonably thumb, thumbs up-y? Reasonably, considering it's 3 o'clock and you've been on Zoom all day? All right then. So what I will do then after class is post the video. Um, if there are any errors or anything that you find in the syllabus or inconsistencies, I screwed up the time for my first class, for instance, please let me know. Um, otherwise, I will hope to see folks Thursday. Yay! All right, stay warm. Enjoy the rest of your garbage day. Until next time, thanks for being here.